so as you can see on the screen i have already uh, written or quoted down the story behind the name so the, the tatler was immediately popular immediately popular because the tatler was immediately popular because the name was already familiar with the town and i have written how uh, how the name came to be yes so it was jonathan swift also aided in the early publication of the essays said the publication of the early essays and during the weeks following bickerstaff's reappearance the correspondence of ladies that is the exchange of letters or the exchange of conversation between the ladies and gentlemen residing in london was full of delighted references to the whimsical new paper that is we are talking about the tatler the whimsical new paper newspaper and guesses were freely exchanged on the identity of the men and the women who served anonymously as examples of the social foibles held up to ridicule so all those bews and coquettes or the men and the women the stock types of whom would be presented in the tatler and then the spectator the men of the town or people of the town people of london would be busy guessing who the real person would be for whom the types have been presented in this whimsical new newspaper the broad appeal of the papers seems to have been not only because of the wit of the wit that was used to, uh, wit that was found behind the writing the witty writing that it uh, that the statler and the spectator made so much popular among the people of london so that was not the only appeal the wit and variety but there was also but also the editorial position which was soon set up the along with the essay assurance of a well educated gentleman of quality still showed a genuine interest in reforming manners that pleased well to do middle class readers now the the middle class of the 18th century society as i said that the society was very much obsessed with emotional modesty in good manner as good manners they were good manners so steel which is steel and then again addison both of them they represented through their writing through their authorship a sort of an intellectual sort of an intellect of a well educated gentleman who was genuinely interested in reforming manners and this this attracted the middle class readers of the society to a to a prominent level like in the essays evils of dueling like dueling we know the sword fighting uh, for 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 winning a bet evils of dueling <coughs> in the essays the essays were uh, mentioned evils of dueling the inadequacy of the insufficiency of education the extravagances of dress extravagances of dress the mo uh, so much importance is was placed on dressing attitudes and the extravagances they were also revealed uh, the hypocrisy behind it were revealed in the essays the the essays also discussed the current marriage rules the current marriage laws and regulations they were that were very oppressive that were uh, very much binding okay as in people did not really like them but they were afraid to speak about it in the society but these periodicals they address these issues 
was unwilling. Richard Steele in the tackle was unwilling to see good manners, sacrifice to fine manners. As in he did not confuse himself. It is not he did not confuse between what can be called as good manners in the generalized generalized sense and the manners that are considered good for the aristocrats. He was because he was unashamed. He was unashamed in his concern for the domestic middle class virtues. Thus, the tattler had an appeal which went far beyond beyond the limits of you know men and women and talking about them, gossip about men and women, which was also a very a, a topic that was highly. Uh, you know about men and women, about good-looking men and women, a topic that was highly exploited in the sentimental comedies of that age, sentimental comedies of that age, which Steele himself popularized. But in the essays and the journalistic periodicals, what he was concerned about the middle-class virtues that ought to be preserved, as in good manners in the general sense, should not be sacrificed or should not lose in a competition with fine manners. Manners that are considered to be good by aristocrats, by rich people. That middle class and poor people cannot afford to have manners as such. Okay. So, Steele was concerned with that. And he was unashaming, unashamedly writing about those concerns. Steele's middle class readers particularly enjoyed the witty pictures of, the, of their social superiors. Because the moral position from which London manners were viewed was essentially their own. The middle class views. It was the middle class views that Steele was actually writing about. Middle, the middle class accepted Steele's observations because it was exactly how they looked at the society. And that is what they were reading. Their perspective was what they were reading in, the, in these papers as well. So when Steele brought the Tatler to a close on January 1711, two years after that is, it was not because he and Addison along with Addison had lost their touch as essayists. No, it was not because of that. It was because that their disguise as Isaac Bickerstaff had been penetrated and because the periodical had become political. The reasons, the reasons for which I have quoted on screen. So altogether it seemed easier to begin a new periodical with, new, with a new fictitious author and a more careful avoidance and a more careful uh, way, endeavor, and a more careful wish to avoid party association, political associations. Being out of employment and surrounded by witty friends who were willing to help, they waited only two months before launching the new enterprise, which was the spectator. And this time, the collaborators, that is Steele and Addison, they managed to keep their journal entirely out of politics and to maintain the editorial policy on which the Tatler had been founded. That is all the purposes that I had spoken about the Tatler, the uh, beginning of the class and throughout the class. All of those purposes, all of those reasons for publication, all of the topics, all of the intentions of the author, they were all maintained in the spectator but with a strict endeavor but with a strict wish strict desire not to be involved politically not to comment politically and what we have then the then was the spectator in which even though it is not better than the Tatler, it can be said, but 
the general level of excellence is usually considered to be much higher than the tackler the spectator usually occupies a greater level of excellence when it comes to comparison with its predecessor the tackler so we can see that we can now say uh, without i have not mentioned much though but whatever i have said already from that you can understand that the spectator emerged the spectator it emerged as a result of a series of changes in the british literary press the restrictions placed upon the literary market laid the foundation for the genre there there was rest there were huge amount of restrictions that were placed in the in the, in the publication industry which was not so much of an industry as it is today at that time so the restrictions placed upon the literary market laid the foundation for the genre for the journalistic writing but they were also arguably the gra the the, gra the cause they were they were also the cause uh, for the gradual decline of the essay cum periodical invented in, in by steel and addison in the 1730s from then on the magazine would be the most popular periodical publication and the traits features the characteristics of the spectator model would be carried on into new literary and journalistic forms so i have written down for you the history of uh, well regulations or licensing regulations uh, that the tatler and the spectator had to go through so there was as you, as as i mentioned earlier also that it was the time of uh, a transition a transitionary period uh, there were the wars of the three kingdoms that is scotland ireland and england the civil war basically the english civil war that broke out the interregnum that is the parliamentary rule after the beheading of charles the 1st in 1649 there was an 11 years of parliamentary rule in which sir oliver cromwell would uh, run a protestant parliament and rule the country and after that there would be the glorious revolution and charles the 2nd would come to the throne making it the restoration of catholicism and therefore the name the restoration age there was the licensing act there was the there were these tracks the stamp acts etc etc so the lapse or failure to renew this act the lapse or failure to renew the act that is the licensing act in the licensing act which monopolized publication or printing when this act lapsed or when it did was not renewed anymore the result was a relatively a relative freedom of the press where pre publication censorship was abolished that the government or the government governing body will not indulge in censoring your work pre publication before it has even been published it did however it did not remove government con control entirely it did not neither did it create an ex exceptionally liberal environment because even without having to submit publications to censorship prior to publication authors and publishers could still be sued and imprisoned after the fact after the publication for blasphemy such as making comments against religion you know obscenity and also going against the nation committing sedition of the sort like something that is very much relatable in today's society as well so over the course of the following years the british literary press expanded steadily the mul this the this multitude of there there were uh, there were multitudes of periodical publications that came out uh, from 1750 to 1775 huge numbers of periodical publications came out and it was very much ironical that as 
London. Like all of these periodicals, you know, if, if they were some of them were very controversial as well. Like they tried to feed into the in the, into that desire of humanity which always wants or which always seeks in excitement even if it is through lies so many of the periodicals they created lots of controversies and as these controversial print their numbers increased the demands for censorship to be imposed also became very common so it was a vicious cycle as censorships were removed press became relatively free with the relatively free press controversies came to be printed in more and more in number and as a result the demand for censorships also grew now this demand for censorship was arguably aimed towards certain hack writers certain uh, gossip writers who were paid to who were paid to inflame you know who were paid to cause rivalry between political parties like hack media okay so literary journalism was thus to some extent increasingly associated with these sort of writers as in they would be paid by political parties in order to inflame other political parties to rise up uh, to, to to help rise a political squabble between various people the spectator sought or the spectator want seek to distance itself from political hack writers by promoting moral reform and it also created a new literary model which would greatly as i had all mentioned earlier influence later periodical publications however in the mid 18th century several stamp acts came into regulation stamp acts uh, were introduced making it more profitable to publish longer publications and this shifted the ownership of london papers away from individual printer or individual printer entrepreneurs like addison and steel they were printing their uh, papers on their own so this shifted you know multiple stamp acts this shifted the ownership of london papers away from individual printer entrepreneurs to large groups of shareholding booksellers the sa periodical was thus slowly replaced by the magazine genre but the new genre kept many of the characteristics of the spectator model So what is the spectator model about is it about then what are the characteristics of of this journal of uh, which we are going to examine so what were the characteristics of the spectator the model set by the spectator became known for its use of an editorial persona which we have discuss we know that its aim at moral reform we know how that came to be with the amalgamation of the characteristics of montaigne's essays and bacon's essays its use of a society of writers we'll talk about that and for the inclusion of readers correspondents we'll talk about that as well the spectator's predecessor that is the tatler i have written the mention the dates of its publication or continuation was richard steel's first period essay periodical essay come periodical it introduced the notion of this editorial persona that is a fictional character an editorial persona is a fictional character that is seemingly seemingly both the author and the editor of the peri periodicals essay the editorial this editorial persona was also uh, sorry offered the actual authors of the periodical protection from personal criticism that's true the primary objective of acquiring a pseudonym is because i mentioned that they were embarrassed because of reasons that i have already discussed 
and it also saves them from any personal attacks right but this persona was also a humorous character who used observations on contemporary society as a way of reforming the models of the same society through humor and thus provided readers with a mix of entertainment and moral instruction the essays of the tatler's editorial persona that is isaac bickerstaff and that of the spectators that is mr spectator the both both of these personas represent great examples of this mixture of moral instruction and entertainment this editorial persona would acquaint would uh, familiarize familiarize the readers with his character in one of the first issues to assure them of his moral credibility so the editorial persona would be introduced first so that the readers can be assured of of his credibility of his moral credibility and thus his suitability as a moral commentator the readership of the spectator is introduced to the periodicals editorial persona in its very first issue Mr spectator is characterized this is important Mr spectator is characterized as a shy and silent figure from a good family he is admitted into most social circles but remains silent among almost all of them so he is a silent observer in his own words Mr spectator claims wherever i see a cluster of people i always mix with them though i never open my lips in my own club thus i live in the world rather as a spectator of mankind than as one of the species this was published in the first volume first issue in 1711 Mr spectator thus declares himself a spectator of mankind his lifelong silent observations have qualified him to comment and judge on the manners and models of the contemporary society this editorial persona of the spectator model of the spectator model moral periodical must consequently then must as a result then possess certain characteristics that makes him or her qualified as a moral commentator now the second most influential characteristic of the spectator was introduced by steel and addison in the spectator through the invention of the spectator club the spectator magazine sorry the spectator journal periodical journal was not presented as being written by one single author or by one single editorial persona but rather by a society of readers and writers mr spectator may have been considered the editor of the paper but he often allowed other members of the spectator club or reader correspondents to publish essays In the second issue of the Spectator, Mr. Spectator describes the six members of the Spectator Club, who seem to represent the different levels of early 18th century society. What were the levels? There was the gentry, the gentle class, the genteel class, that is, the merchant class, the judi the the judici uh, ju judiciary. I'm sorry, that is the practitioners of law, the clergy. that is the church and the military all of these are represented by one member of the club which suggests an attempt to create a ty type of literary microcosm that is a little world representing the larger world so it was an attempt to create a type of literary microcosm where different interests are represented fairly and can be put up against each other and by putting them against each other the flaws of these various classes the virtues of these various class, classes they would come out and as a result the entire picture the, the picture of the entire society would also be created 
this is particularly particularly visible with regard to two specific of the club's members that is one is sir roger de coverley who is a representative of the gentry and sir andrew freeport he is another fictitious character sir roger de coverley is a baronet of an ancient descent from worcestershire worcestershire or uh, it is spelled as worcestershire but pronounced as worcestershire so he is of an uh, of, of a baronet of an ancient descent from worcestershire he represents the conservative landed gentry that is they had huge estates on which laborers work he represents the conservative landed gentry and is a tory is a tory supporter tory supporter that is someone who supports conservatism someone who supports royal royal rights and discipline somebody who does not belong to the working class that is that would be represented by the whigs okay so sir roger de coverley was a clearly a tory then there is the other example of sir andrew freeport who suggests an interest in the liberal trade policies that benefit his business interests so he belongs to the merchant class and definitely a whig supporter the spectator club thus provided richard steel a whig politician with the opportunity to write about whig issues while also allows allowing room for opposing for for contradictory views the spectator could avoid could thus avoid being accused of breaching uh, its its supposed political neutrality by by presenting spectator the spectator by presenting these opposing view points opposing perspectives of different political parties and different social interests it therefore could maintain its place as a politically neutral journal and the final characteristic trait of the spectator model was its inclusion of readers correspondence correspondents would send in letters asking uh, for love advice complain about in immorality in the contemporary society sometimes they would even include essays which they requested or wished to be published in the periodical the, these letters would mainly address the editor but would sometimes refer to other correspondents letter as well the spectator thus created a new type of periodical reader as i had mentioned earlier that there was a readers participation also involved so the reader was transformed from a passive receiver of whatever the essay periodical included or whatever the contents of a particular essay periodical would be so the reader was transformed from a mere passive receiver of these comments of this content into an active participant who would engage with and respond to the essays and letters of other correspondents one critic iona italia has argued that the reader correspondence of the spectator represented the beginnings of an inter reader sociability where readers who were interested in the views and writings of other correspondents used the periodical to communicate with each other this inter reader sociability suggests that the spectator allotted correspondents quite an extensive space quite a legitimate and substantial space to express themselves so in an odd way thus the middle class morality which was viewed by addison and steel limited the success the middle class morality also limited the success of of both the spectator and the tackler the reformative program with which these periodicals be, uh, began the objective of providing moral reform along with entertainment this program what was such interesting that other new uh, you know other that their imitators could not neglect it so there were other people who followed this model so such as another periodical called the adventurer another one called the world another world called the connoisseur 
they all emerged in in the 1750s to recapture some of the variety and wit of their models there were countless reprints of the tatler and spectator during the 18th century dr johnson considered them these 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 essays dr johnson considered them to be among the first books by which both sexes are initiated into the elegances of knowledge to be among the this is a quote to be among the first books by which both sexes are initiated into the elegances of knowledge so throughout the 19th century the tat the tatler and the spectator continued to delight a larger public their position on moral and social matters was very much related to the humanitarian impulses of the time that the human humanitarian uh, wishes of the time to do good for humanity and the familiar essay continued to be pra- to be a practiced literary form during the past 100 years however uh, in dueling which was something that was morally derogatory morally below standard so dueling during the past 100 uh, years uh, dueling had ceased to be a problem witch hunting was now a metaphor there were no real witches anymore and the state had begun to accept responsibilities for human welfare which addison and steel urged so much in their urged for so much in their in their essays the novelist the dramatist meanwhile they have largely taken over the art of propaganda of manipulation that is of of, of swaying the society to uh, to one uh, to one side or the other leaving more direct efforts to tell people what to think to the writers of informative articles and newspaper editorials the modern reader cannot then expect from the tatler and the spectator the kind of experience which many victorians had the experience of being addressed on subjects still important from a position still shared in a form which had not been abandoned and therefore the spectator held such an important position in the society of the time along with its predecessor the tatler which laid the foundational grounds for the success of the spectator